This is a section from the book entitled Tumultuous Times, written by Fathers Francisco and Dominic Radecki. And this is a section concerning John Paul II. John Paul II is one of the most charismatic religious leaders in history. His international popularity is vividly portrayed on the cover of Time magazine, October 15, 1979, as a smiling, photogenic prelate pictured with the caption, John Paul II Superstar. During the past 25 years, John Paul II has traveled more than 774,200 miles and visited nearly 1,000 cities in 133 countries. Cumulatively, more people have turned out to see John Paul II than any other figure in history. According to the Los Angeles Times, his trip to Toronto for World Youth Day, July 18th through 28th, 2002, was a week-long event that feels like a combination of Woodstock, the Olympics, and an old-fashioned revival meeting headlined by Pope John Paul II. Like a chameleon which can rapidly change skin color in order to blend in, John Paul II adapts his beliefs to fit his surroundings. In India, he received cow dung ashes from a Hindu priestess in honor of the god Shiva. In Japan, he praised Buddhism. In Morocco, he lauded Islam. In Africa, he prayed with animists and dialogued with voodoo chiefs, and while in Canterbury, he prayed with the Anglican Archbishop. On his international travels, he habitually dialogues and worships with non-Catholics and makes no attempt to convert them. His Early Life Karol Wojtyla was born in Wadowice, Poland on May 18, 1920. At the age of 15, he began a successful acting career which lasted six years. According to his classmate, Antoni Bodanovich, Wojtyla devoted every free moment to the theater. In the play Baladina on May 14, 1937, he masterfully filled two separate roles, the leading role and that of a missing actor whom he had to replace. John Paul II's phenomenal charisma, witnessed in his later life, quite likely can be attributed to his early training in the theater. The Wojtylas moved to Krakow in August 1938 in order for Carroll to pursue studies in philosophy, theater, and poetry. A month later, Carroll began his literary studies at the Jagiellonian University. He became heavily involved in Krakow's theatrical scene and was well known for his powerful and beautiful voice often reading epic Polish poetry, or others of his own composition, at public meetings. Nazi and Soviet Invasions of Poland On September 1, 1939, Hitler's Panzer divisions rolled across the Polish frontier, and despite the gallant attempts of the Polish army, Poland was overrun with alarming speed. On the 17th, the Soviets also invaded Poland, quickly swallowing up the eastern third of the country, and effective opposition soon ceased. Carroll's studies suddenly ended on November 6, 1939, when the 183 university professors were arrested by the Nazis and transported to slave labor camps. The Catholic University of Lublin was shut down by the German occupation, with numerous professors imprisoned, tortured, or killed outright. The Soviets were just as ruthless and eliminated all who stood in their way. On March 5, 1940, the Politburo ordered the shooting of at least 22,000 Polish officers who were labeled inveterate and incorrigible enemies of the Soviet power. The slaughter was carried out in the Katyn forest, and many of the bodies were then thrown into common graves. Immediately afterwards, 61,000 of the victims' family members were transferred, so to speak, to Kazakhstan. In September 1940, in order to avoid being sent to a labor camp, Wojtyla began to work at a quarry as an explosives helper. The following year, he was transferred to the Solve chemical factory outside Krakow. Tragedy followed tragedy as Carol experienced the death of his mother Amelia, April 13, 1929, brother Edmund, December 4, 1932, and father Carol, February 18, 1941. It is remarkable that in spite of the horrible atrocities committed by the Nazis and Communists against the Polish people, Karol Wojtyla always escaped unharmed. Many biographers note that those around him, including bishops, priests, and university professors, were often imprisoned or executed. For example, May 1942, Gestapo arrests Wojtyla and others. His workers' card gets him off. The others are shot at Auschwitz. 
Did Carol fraternize with the Nazis and Communists? On December 24, 1965, allegations surfaced in a letter published in the Gazeta Krakowska, written by the workers of the former Solvay factories, where he himself worked during the war, of Wojtyla having been a collaborator throughout this period and of working for the National Socialists. In December 1942, Carol attended classes for the priesthood at Cardinal Sapieha's residence in Krakow. Three years later, he became an assistant professor at Jagiellonian University, where he taught the history of dogmas and detailed systematic theology. Wojtyla's Priesthood After completing four years of studies, Carol was ordained to the priesthood on November 1, 1946, by the Cardinal Archbishop of Krakow. Father Wojtyla obtained his degree in theology at the Angelicum in Rome on July 2, 1947, and a doctoral degree from the Jagiellonian University Faculty of Theology on December 16, 1948. Carol served as assistant priest at the parish of Niegovic for seven months and held the position of parish priest at St. Florian's Church in Krakow from 1948 through 1951. As a young priest, Wojtyla organized frequent outings with young people. Rising early, his day always began with a solitary swim. Then he said mass for his young followers on an improvised altar, upturned kayaks. As for the crucifix, it was made from a couple of crossed paddles. He continued the outings and informal style of mass even after he became a bishop. All the while, the communist government tightened its control in Poland. But it was hard for the communist government at Warsaw to make headway so long as Cardinal Holond, the Archbishop of Warsaw, remained alive. For he had been a prisoner of the Germans and nobody could doubt his Polish as well as his Roman loyalty. After his death in 1948, the government made more progress, and an agreement was reached, without consultation with Rome, between the Polish hierarchy and the government in April 1950. Less than six months had passed before the Polish hierarchy found itself compelled to protest against numerous violations of this agreement. But the communist masters at Moscow were well satisfied, and in August 1950 they procured a similar agreement in Hungary, under the aegis of the origin form, established in the same year to undertake the training of those entrusted with the special task of dispelling the faith, for which purpose they would pose as priests. An all-out effort was made by the communists to sow religious confusion in Eastern Europe generally. Lino Gussoni describes the conditions in Poland during the early 1950s in his 1954 book, The Silent Church, Facts and Documents Concerning Religious Persecution Behind the Iron Curtain. One of the most painful aspects of the condition of the church in Poland is that many priests are under surveillance, and that many have been arrested and sent to jail without a previous trial. The clergy and the episcopate feel painfully the vexing system of continuous control and repeated summonings to the offices of the police or the local authorities. Many have been arrested in churches and confessionals. The surveillance extends even to bishops who, during their journeys to assemblies or their visits to the dioceses, are accompanied by many police. It is difficult to say just how many priests are presently in prison, as of 1954 but it would be more than 700, averaging about 35 from each diocese. Higher, instead, is the number of members of religious orders who are deported or who disappeared. It is believed that these may total 1,200. Approximately 80% of the church's property had been seized, including 2,143 places of worship, 1,100 monastic houses, 229 publishing houses, and 85 schools. Father Karol Wojtyla's academic teaching career began in October 1953 when he took over a course in Catholic social ethics in the Jagiellonian University's Faculty of Theology. When the faculty was suppressed by the communist regime in early 1954, Wojtyla continued to teach the social ethics course in the School of Theology that was quickly organized for seminarians, who now had no university-based theology courses to attend. Like his Jagiellonian course, these seminary courses ran for two hours a week, and Wojtyla taught them throughout the 1950s. In spite of the communist movement to dispel the Catholic faith, Father Wojtyla was allowed a great deal of freedom. There are some questions that need to be answered regarding his teaching career. 
Why was he allowed to travel to Rome? Why was he allowed to teach? Why was Father Wojtyla appointed to the Philosophy Department of the Catholic University of Lublin on October 12, 1954, at a time when the Communists arrested the rector and nine of its professors? Why wasn't he arrested? Why was he allowed such a free lifestyle, acting, camping, kayaking, hiking, and skiing, while Poland was suffering under Nazi and Communist occupation? Cardinal Minzenti specifically noted that anyone under Communist occupation who is allowed to travel freely must be a collaborator. Ascending the ladder, Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski, primate of Poland who had been placed under house arrest for three years by the communists, strongly opposed Wojtyla's ideas regarding ecumenism and changes to the mass. Archbishop Basiak bypassed Wyszynski and insisted on the appointment of Wojtyla as auxiliary bishop of Krakow on July 4, 1958. On July 8th, Father Wojtyla met with the Cardinal and merely asked, Where do I sign? That July 8th remained fixed on the primate's memory. It was the first time he had been bypassed in the appointment of a Polish bishop. Since the authorities had made it so hard to conduct church business, Pius XII had granted Wyszynski the extraordinary privilege of selecting and keeping on hand a list of future bishops already approved by the Pope. When Wyszynski wanted to appoint someone, he would send a secret message to Rome, and as soon as he got a coded signal from the pontiff, he would go ahead with the appointment. Karol Wojtyla's name was not on Wyszynski's list. Wojtyla received Episcopal consecration on September 28, 1958. Karol was not among those favored for the post, partly because of his age. He was the youngest person to ever become bishop in Poland. He was only 38 and partly because he was too involved in his research and the theological aspects of the priesthood to be able to find time for this essentially pastoral role. Karol Wojtyla lived in Krakow for exactly 40 years, including four years as auxiliary bishop, two years as the de facto leader of the archdiocese, and 14 as its archbishop. His appointment as archbishop in itself is quite interesting. Archbishop Eugenius Basiak of Krakow died on June 15, 1962, and the vacancy needed to be filled. As a result of the communist occupation of Poland, the state usurped the right to approve the Episcopal nominees of the Polish primate, Cardinal Wyszynski. The decision ultimately fell to Zenon Kalisko, the Communist Party's second-ranking figure. He was the party's chief ideologist and the guardian of Polish communist orthodoxy. Klisko, who did not lack ego, was very pleased with himself for having vetoed all seven names the primate Wyszynski had proposed over the past year and a half. I am waiting for Wojtyla, Klisko said, and I'll continue to veto names until I get him. They had rejected them, the other candidates, because the communists were convinced that they could find, in that careful student of Marxism, Karol Wojtyla, an interlocutor who was more conciliatory and malleable than the cardinal primate. It was the first time in 13 years that Poland's communist rulers had permitted the appointment of a residential archbishop. Wojtyla was obviously favored by the communists. It was the communist regime that pushed for his appointment to the critical see of Krakow, because the communists thought he was a bishop they could work with. Jonathan Luxmore relates new information taken from the archives of the Polish secret police from the book Teski Wojtyli Wojtyla Files. From the party's viewpoint, Bishop Wojtyla was a preferable candidate for Archbishop of Krakow to two others being considered by the church. Bishop Jerzy Stroba, who was a decided opponent of all state cooperation, and Father Tadeusz Federowicz, who was totally subservient to the church hierarchy. It was said the regime had deliberately waited for Bishop Wojtyla's name to come up. In a letter to Cardinal Wyszynski a month later, Poland's communist premier, Joseph Kajrankiewicz, noted tersely that he had no reservations about the 42-year-old's appointment. Bishop Vida Elmer dispels a common misconception about Karol Wojtyla. While living in Poland, Karol Wojtyla did not suffer persecution. The assumption that he did is gratuitous. The fact that JP II, John Paul II, came from a communist land earned him a great deal of sympathy in the West. Many good-hearted people have taken it for granted that Karol Wojtyla had to endure the same or similar hardships 
as the other members of the Catholic clergy did. I can say this assumption gives a free and unearned credit to Wachtilla out of the sufferings of the other priests and bishops who really endured persecution. At one time or other, the communist regime at Poland threw into jail hundreds of priests. Even Cardinal Wyszynski was under house arrest for a long period of time. Meanwhile, Karol Wojtyla enjoyed his freedom traveling inside and outside of the country. He was given the opportunity to visit schools and universities abroad, to learn several languages, to hold lectures inside and outside of Poland. Eventually, he was favored a son of the government. No subject of a communist government can enjoy such rare privileges without performing proportionate services to the regime. Thank you.